first of all, thank you, uh, friends, for tuning in. Um, happy to have my guest here today uh, returning for a second interview. And uh, my guest today is the author of a, 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 a masterpiece, I call it, called Anatomy Trains. And of course, um, I'm talking about Tom Myers. Tom, welcome and thank you for joining me again. How are you doing today? Hey, Carl. Thanks for having me back in and, and um, you're calling this an interview. But uh, as I remember, last time we had a conversation and I'm looking forward to another conversation now. <laughs> I've been thinking about it for a while and now we've got the COVID blues. So I'm home and uh, actually not feeling blue at all, but thinking, gee, maybe we can talk again. Cause I'm, you know, doing different <laughs> things now with, with the isolation and the quarantine and this and that and the self sheltering. I'm finding that I'm, I think a lot of us are being creative and doing different things now. We absolutely have to do different things now. It's, uh, um, I, I certainly have my days of feeling like I'm going through molasses. I, I have a tendency to bipolar, and so sometimes I uh, feel like I'm moving through molasses because it's just so much momentum has been lost uh, in people who had training businesses and, mm. and things like that. And, you know, I'm in the business of gathering people and then teaching them about touch. That is not something that's happening right no. now. So lots and lots of people are trying to find creative ways. We're trying to find creative ways. I don't want to fire my staff or, you know, furlough them or any of those things. So we're working very hard to see how we can be creative in this time. And so I feel very awake and alive, um, but it's certainly a challenging time. Yeah, it is. It is. It's really hit hard in so many different places, so many different businesses, so many families and people. Um, we were, uh, emailing a little bit here and talking off camera uh, there's a one of the reasons i was thinking boy i'd love to talk with tom myers again because for a lot of reasons but right now one thing that i notice and this sort of stems back to our first conversation um so covid is happening people are self-sheltering people are out of work i'm out of work a lot of people out of work but i have to get creative and well i still need to keep moving so uh, since I've seen you last, I had a hip replacement, and I'm moving very, very well, but I'm not going to be running like I was. I don't want to shorten the lifespan of this wonderful new hip, but I'm riding my bicycle. Mm -hmm. What I'm finding, I think this is going on the end of the fourth week in a row. I ride almost every day, a few miles or maybe 15, 20, whatever. Mm -hmm. Go down the road, hit the trails. Now, I've been riding these trails for 27 years. That's how long I've been at this address. I have never seen more people out walking around, moving, hiking than I am now. And I really think it has to do with the fact that we're home. We're having to do other things. And fortunately, even though COVID is bad, movement is good. <laughs> I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a lot more movement out there. So many people on these trails. I have to be careful not to run them over. Yep. So what are you seeing out there? That is, I'm getting this by report because I live in a tiny little hamlet in uh, on the coast of Maine. And so I can do my morning run without um, seeing more than one or two people in cars, maybe. Um, so we don't have that, that crowding problem. But... Uh, lots of people are coming into our site or, you know, ask me online or things like that who are having to change their movement practices because um, the gym isn't open. Uh, so you're left to your own devices. So I am often left to my own devices in hotels. So a TRX is a really good thing to have. You throw That's it over good. the hotel door and, and you're, because those hotel gyms are often so bad. And uh, so making my own gym out of a hotel room is something that I've started sticking in my suitcase. Um, so I'm used to, and I guess you're used to with your bicycle, finding our own needs for exercise. But a lot of people, women especially, exercise socially. You know, it's, they're all on bikes, they're all talking with each other. It's, it's, that's part of the experience. And uh, so I think it's great that people are using nature more. I think it's great that people are out moving more. 
Uh, <laughs> somebody sent me a cartoon the other day of, of the mind saying, get up, and the body saying, no. <laughs> I've talked to people who had that experience, too, that it's just so anxiety-producing and, and depressing. Yeah that they haven't been able to do what they thought they were going to do, you know, write the great American novel during the time of COVID-19 or get themselves in total shape for the summer. And then you get sitting around by yourself. And if you don't have any social thing for your activity, for some people, that's really a, a game changer. And uh, for people, loners like you and I, we're all right. <laughs> we'll keep doing our exercise. Yeah. People don't want to hang out with me anyways. <laughs> but no, we, we it, it is good. I've I've always been a fan of being in nature, being outside, and you know, running and bicycling. Uh, um, but I'm I'm finding that um, it's been challenging. Well, I work at a gym. I work at a university, at Syracuse University. So we got shut down a month ago. Mm -hmm. That was it. No more classes. The classes go online. No more training sessions. No more rehab sessions. No more nothing. So right now I have a lot of time on my hands and um, I'm not working out in the gym like I was. I would do some of their stuff. I'm not really too much into traditional weightlifting and all that, but I'll do some here and there. But I'm glad to see, as I go off on my tangent, which mm -hmm. I'm famous for, I'm glad to see movement happening. And I, as bad as COVID is and as bad as it is for people to lose in income and have financial difficulties and whatever else, is coming out of this. I'm digging the movement side. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you have somebody with you there. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, just I, I'll tell you, this is a, you're you're a trainer, and maybe you don't have this feeling, but um, as a manual therapist, I'm not touching anybody anymore, and uh, I call it vitamin T. You know, sure, I hope I'm making the people feel better who are coming to see me, but I also feel better because I get to touch. You get that kind yeah. of intimacy contact there's there's some kind of nutrient um given over by touch and suddenly not only are we losing all our money but we've lost that nutrient that we got from being in intimate contact with people i mean even if you're a yoga teacher you're you're like right in there with them or if yeah. you're a trainer you're right in there with them. yes the intimacy and engagement is really hard to get when you're in social isolation um, yeah it is the uh, intimacy the um energy you know it's it's a little bit more challenging to create energy online on a video chat doing a workout with somebody. <laughs> Although I thought about doing it for years and I never did because I just chose not to and I have plenty of clients. I didn't need any more. I couldn't take any more. Now I don't have any. Well, I do, but they're all online. So real <laughs> quick, real fast, I got creative. So, okay, this is how we're doing this. Experiment, fail. Experiment, succeed, experiment, epic fail, and then finally kind of tailor it into, oh, okay, this, this works. Creativity. So, uh, Brene Brown, who goes around and gives, gives talks, has been talking about FFT, uh, and that's short for effing first time, where a lot of us doing things for the FFT, and... Uh, a, a lot of people in our society, just because of the ease of phones and apps and things like that, if they're not good at something right away, they don't stick to it. And um, I had a wife like that once. She would, she was really good at things, but she wouldn't undertake anything that she wasn't already good at. You know, it's, it's so it's limiting if you do that. And and so I've been taking on the spirit that you know what, I'm a terrible cook, and I've gone through all my life appreciating other people's food and. <laughs> Cleaning up because I'm good at doing the dishes, but I'm good at cooking. But guess what? <laughs> guess who's cooking? <laughs> I'm cooking. So I've just been forgiving myself for the bad meals that I've served myself, and that makes me very appreciative of all the good meals that I had over the years. And uh, so I, FFT, I really like her phrase, FFT. It's just you, you got to, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing badly at first, and then you'll hone in on what's necessary. Yeah, I love that. I, I have to tell you, so two days ago, I was with my chiropractor who I just love. He's such a great chiropractor person. He says, oh, I was watching your interview with Tom Tom Myers. Said, He's like my idol. What's he like? I said, he's really smart, really informative, fun, and funny. <laughs> so 
Thank you for your humor too, because that's just, it's always fun to talk with you. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, yeah, so in, in this, by the way, for people watching or listening, we have no script here. All we did is email yesterday and say, hey, maybe we'll talk about COVID and movement and whatever else. So I think I'm going to title this video, A Conversation with Tom Myers. Okay, well, I, I, I really, you know, I'm, I, I'm looking forward to this conversation, but I've said for me what is the most important thing, which is don't underestimate whatever your job was doing, coaching, personal training, teaching classes, or working one-to-one -one as I do, that you've, had a, that you've had something that's really essential to how you build your body, your, your perception of your inner body and, and our relationship between our mind and our body is really dependent on, well, for me, touch, and for maybe you moving with people, certainly for, uh, I'm talking to a yoga teacher friend of mine in Hawaii, and she's just mourning the loss of this intimate connection that she has with people, which, as you just said, you know, the internet is a really thin slice. You can get some of that coming down the internet, but it's difficult. It's difficult to have that same thing that, a, you know, your actual presence has for people. Right. And it is. I, I, want I want practitioners to recognize that, whoa, it's not just that you got money troubles. You've got an inside uh, thing going on that, that you'll have to adjust to because you're no longer working with people in the same way. And uh, the only other thing I can say with definitude on this is having been through the Kennedy assassination and several other events on 9-11 and my own personal losses and things, we won't come back from this to the same society that we had before. It's, as as 9-11 changed us, you know, you, you go, you're, you're young, you don't remember what it was like to travel on airplanes when you could smoke on airplanes and you didn't have to pull out your ID and everything to get on an airplane and have everything searched. You know, we, we have moved into that after 9-11. That whole thing happened after 9-11. Yeah. We're all, all used to it now, and we think that's the way airports are. That's not the way airports were. Airports were like bus stations and, you know, some years oh, ago. Like the old movies where... Um you people, well, my wife and I were just talking the other night. We were watching something that was recorded pre 9 11, and whoever it was got to go and chase the woman he wanted right to the gate when she's ready to board. You know, you don't go to the gate, you don't get past security now without a boarding pass. You know, in the old days, you could go and wave bye to everybody or greet them. Yeah, it's not like Off that. The plane. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. I remember smoking on planes too. I didn't smoke, but I remember the smoking section. Um, yeah, I'm going to be, what, 59, so I don't recall Kennedy, although it was during my life, but I was two and a half, so I don't Yeah, remember. no, I was 13, so I, 13 or 14, so I was awake. Oh, you know, sure, yeah, 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 this is, uh, is uh, a friend of mine said the other day that his daughter told him, he says, Dad, I think we're living history right now, this is big, and things won't be, this, She's, this is like an 11-year-old beyond her years girl. Mm. So that's actually the, you started to go down a road that I wanted to ask you about. Uh, um, a question is, do you foresee how we may come back and how we're working with people? Um, as a trainer, I'm not touching anybody per se other than some physical cueing. If I ask permission, can I touch your shoulder? Can I touch your, um, mm. I may apply some kinesiology tape but it's out of my scope to apply for pain, so I'll just do it for external cueing. I get that's how I get away with it, because mm -hmm. Steve Capobianco said I could. <laughs> uh, hey, Steve, you know Steve, right? Yeah, I know Steve. Hey, I love Steve. He's such a good guy. Uh, actually, it's his daughter who said who said that the other day. We were talking a couple of days ago. So my daughter said this. So, anyways. Um, I'm kind of wondering if I might be going back to the university in a few weeks or months and maybe I'm always wearing gloves and a mask or something. Um, no, I don't think that's, I think the change is going to be subtler than that. I, I can't, I'm not no epidemiologist or public health person, so I can't tell you the details of uh, whether it's antibody testing or temperature checks, or I don't know how they're going to run the tail end of this. I mean, we've just been, it's like I, I compare it to a whale. Um, first came the wave of fear in front of the whale, and then comes the whale of the uh, of the actual disease, and then we're all going to be affected by the tail of the whale, which is the economic thing, which is going to last much longer than the actual epidemic. 
Yeah, yeah. So I don't, you know, I, I presume that this will go down to something where it's manageable, like our flu. Um, you know, we're at the time we're having this conversation, the national conversation is about when, how long to stay shut down and when to open up the economy. And yes. um, you, you can't put the, all of us into suspended animation forever. That's true. I, I rather hope they don't do it too soon. Yeah, me too. Because the, the spikes will begin to look like the letter M instead of just an upside down V. Um, if, if we go too soon, but that's, I'm, I'm parroting what I know from other people, not what I know from myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, you will, we'll have to do whatever we have to do to cover touching with people who've had it, who've had it and who, people who haven't had it and are uh, immune. I, I, I'm sure there will be procedures for that within six months or so. And um, <clears throat> we really will get it down to size when we have a, a vaccine and that's 18 months or so. So what are we going to do? All of us who touch people, all of us who move with people, all of us who get together and sweat together, what are we going to do for the next 18 months? It's, uh, it's going to be crazy. Now, are people going to, for instance, people who went to their personal trainer, are they going to have, are they going to have fallen in love with Chad who does it on workout.com and not go back to the gym because all they have to do is roll out of bed? I mean, this is what the students are saying for the online learning. Yeah. Well, I think it's about the same, but what's really great is I don't have to get dressed and go to school. I just roll out of bed and do my classes. Okay, so what is that going to look like when we go back to school. Are people going to go back to school all the time or is there going to be more independence, especially for people in high school to do independent study at home? I think that's going to change. I think the home services are going to change. That um, <laughs> I'm going to really geek out on you here, Carl. <laughs> this is what I love. This, this is I, my thing, man. I see us on the earth. There's 10 there's 10 billion people on a very, very thin surface of the Earth. It goes maybe seven miles up to the top of Everest and seven miles down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. That's 14 miles in which all of life occurs, right? Right, right, yeah. On the surface of the Earth. And we have just put so many of us on this planet in such a short time. Um, you could compare that to the growth, a, a rapid growth of cells, right? We went from, I don't know, probably a few hundred million people in the time of Jesus to billions and billions of people. Now. Billions. And, uh, yeah, I sound like Carl Sagan, billions and billions. <laughs> the, the only place you see growth like that, there are only two places you see growth like that in the natural world. One is a cancerous tumor. Mm. That grows really quickly, mm -hmm. and the other one is a human, or well, any embryo. Mm -hmm. Embryo. Okay. You also get an incredible proliferation of cells, like we've gotten an incredible proliferation of humans on the planet. Now, one of them ends up with a cancerous tumor that can't survive on its own, that parasites into your arterial system, and eventually can draw down your energy and kill you. The other one results in a baby who will grow up and maybe support you someday. <laughs> oh, I don't think my ah. daughter's going to um, but, uh, but you see the difference of what I'm saying. Are we participating in the growth of something that really has no organization and is therefore in this random kind of thing? Or are we watching something that is actually quite ordered, however much it looks disordered to us? from our local little vantage point, is actually orderly and is actually leading us to be a species that could live on this planet in a, in a balance, in, I'll just shorten it by saying in an ecological way, in some kind of way that was sustainable for us and the other bits on the planet. This disease, as, often, as awful as it's been, might be one of those signs that ticks us over to coming towards being more of a, um, an embryo, an organism, something that's leading towards an organized baby rather than something that's leading towards an unorganized tumor. <laughs> I don't know if that was too geeky, man, but that's what I'm thinking about these days. No, actually, that makes a lot of sense to me. I love how you put that because I've wondered if this is uh, maybe in a, another analogy because I, I, I can't think 
I, I think of reset. Is this a reset button? Are we going to be reset into, or 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 maybe not even reset, but uh, will this cause us to get back to being more, or let's say less caught up in stuff, because there's stuff everywhere. Mm. Tablets, communication, this and that, and GPS, and I've got, you know, if, if there's someone in my car with me and I'm driving and they're telling me where to go and I've got GPS too. I have two backseat drivers now. It drives me crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Turn one of them off and you know it's going to be a GPS. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the park here, whatever. But no, it's, uh, are, are we going to get away from that? I actually feel like right now, I've been actually, the reason it took me nine minutes to answer your email is because I've been getting away a little bit from the phone when we had this little thing at the beginning, a glitch before we went on the air here. Tom tried to get into the call, said I was on another call, but I wasn't on another call, so I don't know what that was. But just starting to distance myself and what it's causing me to do is slow down and move, actually move more. And I'm a movement guy, so um, I, I need to shed a couple of pounds, but. I'm moving. I like it. It feels really good. I feel like I've gotten stronger in the past month. I see people out there who are moving. Actually, I feel like people are a little friendlier now. There's less traffic on the roads. This is and the people good. in New Delhi can see the blue sky. You know, it's the, all all the the fact that we're not burning any oil has made the skies clearer all over the earth. Oh yeah, it makes me a little bit happy. If we do get swept off the planet, it won't take the planet long to 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 sort of bury us under the loam and <laughs> start something yeah, the new. The pollution right? level is down. The pollution's definitely yeah, down. I mean, that, that should teach us something, that the pollution level is so far down that um, you know maybe we could clean our, our, our act when we get out of this thing. Yeah, yeah. I feel like there's, uh, uh, for lack of better terms, it's almost like a little, uh, not from a religious standpoint, but a little come to Jesus meeting, like, okay, Let's get your act together now and realize what's really important. Whatever that is to you, family, um, other people, being healthy, moving. Movement's a big one. But to answer Stephen's 11-year-old, it really depends on how long this lasts. If this lasts a short time, we will bounce back and it will have been a moment but we will reestablish something more like what we had before. If we can't get back to business in six to 12 months, it's going to do a profound shift on how our society is organized. And I don't think it's going to be very pretty. <laughs> yeah. That's a little bit scary in itself. Yeah. That's a little bit scary in itself. And I, that's why I think that in this kind of current battle that we're seeing between we can't, let the economy go down because that's going to kill people and we can't let uh, people go out because that's going to kill people. Uh, there, there will come a time when those two things will cross each other. I don't think it's yet, but um, that the need of people to exchange is really, really strong. Not only the psychological stuff that we've been talking about, but just commerce. Um, yeah. if, it, if it just totally stops, then the, the works will get very gummed up. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to get, that could be really bad, real messy. Um, so I was on uh, the anatomy train site this past week. And I know you have a COVID message there. And so I'm just curious, um, how are you, what pathway are you taking now with the education that you're doing? Are you, uh, cause you, you do, you and your, people who teach for you, you do a lot of live workshops every, every year, don't you? <laughs> and, and, I, and I'm sorry to voice my business stuff on anybody else, but I took out two forms of insurance. One was I made sure that we were active on four continents. I figured, okay, if Asia goes down, I got Australia. If Australia goes down, I got Europe. All four continents, boom, at once. Uh, and then man. I took out a second form of insurance, which was that our courses go for trainers, for a yoga therapist, for massage therapists, for physiotherapists, some for doctors in Asia acupuncturist so I thought I've got a multiple profession insurance so no matter what profession has a scandal or goes up in arms or doesn't have any money I've got these other professions every one of our professions who would have thunk right <laughs> who would have thunk yes I I, uh, I have actually some I'm 
not much, but I have some sympathy for Mr. Trump in terms of this thing came out of left field and landed on his doorsteps without so much as a thank you, ma'am. And <laughs> I understand that it's, that it's really difficult to get rid of. Okay, so what are we doing? The um, One of the things that we're doing is self-care for practitioners, a la what we were talking about, and, mm -hmm. and lots of people are doing what you can do with your breath, what you can do with your movement, what you can do to keep yourself calm um, in these things. and. Um, so we've, we've done some of those, but now what I really want to do is make sure that the skills of the manual therapy community doesn't fall down too much, uh, while we're in this period. So, um, although it's different all over the world, most people can't get together at the moment. So for instance, we're doing a, a thing of self massage. Uh, we haven't announced it yet, but, um, I've been working it up where we'll, I'll be working my way through the body anatomically piece by piece by piece and people will be sitting there massaging themselves to find out about their own anatomy and to find out the places that they didn't know that actually hurt inside them but they didn't feel it before and, and um, yeah. so people need to know themselves is one of the things that's going to happen early on in this. And then uh, once you can get one other person around there then I, I uh, it is very reluctant for me to try to teach manual therapy on a on a video thing. That's so. What we're doing is we're having the classes and we're doing all the lecture part of the classes, um, all the body reading, the part that you can do outside the class, and then there will be a one day catch up of manual therapy when we can have a manual therapy class again. That's that's the model that we're doing. That's a really hard model for trainers, obviously personal trainers or athletic coaches, because you got to be there and you got to put in the effort. But the yeah. uh, uh, we can get some of the background across to people, and then um, hopefully within four to six months, we'll be able to pick them up, put them in a manual therapy class, and catch them up. Yeah, that, well, that's good because you can still get out there with the education. People can learn about things, but just there's a little different pathway to do it. That's great. Yeah, yeah, there's no substitute for, for in-person classes. I, I, no. I'm not going to be happy at all if that's the outcome of this thing, but that we can't do personal classes at all. Uh, that would be a great, great loss to me. Um, oh, yeah. Personally, personally, yes, but I just mean it would be a great loss to society. And it's, it's kind of the thing, if I go back to the bit with the priests and that we all went through with the childhood sexual yeah. abuse, uh -huh. um, on the one hand, nobody wants uh, people in a position of power touching people inappropriately, and especially children, and going through that whole thing and all the violence that has been written upon women. I'm all with that. On the other hand, it meant that nobody could touch anybody. Teachers can't touch students, and uh, the in a, the, a whole bunch of appropriate touching was thrown out with the inappropriate touching. And yeah. If, if this serves to distance us even more in terms of touching, I will be very sad. But I think that we'll have the testing, we'll have the stuff necessary so that we can go back into relationship again. And in that case, I think people are going to really miss and really want the actual connection of, say, a personal session with you or, um, you know, again, I'm talking about the actual touching sessions that we, that we do. Yeah. Well, I, I like how you put that, too. Um... You know, I think um, I, I work in an academic atmosphere, and there are a lot of good things about it. And then there are the other things that are a total pain in the ass. But what you said about touching and, you know, the inappropriate touching, I'm on board with that, too. I mean, you know, we don't need that. Yet if it completely negates the proper touching and, and makes it not acceptable, that's not good either because things have gone, what I find happening is these extremes and one, you know, series of bad things happen. But what about all the good that was happening that now is you're stripped away from doing that anymore when people actually need it, but this made it, this over here made it bad to do or did it really? Cause it's really not when mm -hmm. it's done with the right intention, the right purpose. Um, trying to help people is what it's all about and I, I that bothers me that kind of stuff just drives me crazy the extreme extreme opposite ends of things so I'm with you I didn't really say anything profound at all what I had to do is and I wasn't trying to is I'm agreeing with you and I I hope we can come back to uh 
what I would call, let's get real. <laughs> let's just grow up, man. Let's get real, you know? Not, well, don't you think that this has exposed some of the illusions that we were all working under for the last 30, 40 years? <laughs> um, that, that we could maintain a society this complex uh, without any of the stuff coming underneath. I mean, it happened to be a global pandemic, but it could have been a God knows what that takes out the electrical system or the internet or something like that. And, and as we get more people in the world, we probably should be readier than we were for things like this. We, I don't like to go this way, but as a society, we've gone soft in the sense that we have not been up against things like this. We've had an adequate supply of food and uh, say what you will about people starting the educational system. We've had a pretty good education in this country and, and uh, uh, now some of the weaknesses underneath that are being exposed. And uh, yeah. some of that is just plain old people to people things. And I, I think there will be just an amazing rush of people together when this is let up. And I hope that that goes in a good direction. I do too. I, I hope so too. I hope it doesn't take too long. I heard something on the news last night about uh, a pinprick test. One drop of blood results in 10 minutes to find out, you know, about your antibodies and whether you are immune or not, maybe carry a card with you. <laughs> so you can show your, oh, it's my COVID card. I'm, I'm immune. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then we go towards this kind of two tiered society. I've got a COVID card. So I get all these privileges. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've read too many it, science it opens fiction up another novels. web of complexity, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've read too many science fiction novels not to be able to make a dystopian future out of almost anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. Uh, well, yeah, it's definitely interesting times now. Interesting times. Uh, mm -hmm. now, not that this has to do anything with anything, but my new workout is something that I didn't want to do that I decided I want to do and I'm benefiting from it and it has to do with moving in a different way and it's doing yard work and, <laughs> and getting into those deep squats and doing the rototilling and doing the truckload of dirt last Saturday comes in whole dump truckload of beautiful dirt to level out some things in the yard put over yeah. here because it's kind of a really big yard here yeah. a couple acres so man I'll tell you I was really sore the past couple weeks and it feels good that that's a nice kind of movement. I fired up so many muscles, chains of muscles. I couldn't even believe how good I felt. And bad. people people think I'm crazy because I have a scythe. Do you know what I mean by a scythe? What the Grim Reaper comes along yes, with and cuts I you do. off. Yeah. And uh, I, I I use it to to mow and and you know there's a certain time in the year that will, will be very shortly here in the spring when the grass is just coming up like crazy and I have to go around all the fences and telephone poles and stuff with this and uh it's just a little swinging motion of the body right it's, and you get into the rhythm of it and it's really sweet and uh, the first couple of weeks that i was doing that i got really sore too because it's not a question of oh you weren't strong enough it's that you're not using those particular neuromuscular units right we may use a muscle but we don't use all the neuromuscular units in a muscle so then you start doing it and muscles that you're using regularly can feel sore because you're kicking up the substance P in the fascicles in the neurovascular bundles that they weren't using before. So uh, I think it's, <laughs> I've always said, you, you know, why are you getting fit? You're getting fit to be useful. That's the, that's the, yeah. the yeah, purpose. They're, they're like in, in the, if, if you look over the course of time itself, gyms are a relatively new entity in the human, you know, in our world, right? I mean, when was the first gym? I don't know. Athens. As, as far as I know, the first gym, uh, gym, I don't know in Athens, but it was in Greece um, because that was the first time, and I don't know about Egypt, um, <clears throat> but you get a nobleman class and they don't have to work because they're the sons of rich, sons and daughters of rich people. So a gymnasium was a place for them to go to correct the fact that their life wasn't movementy enough. Oh, wow, really? I had no idea. Now that's very interesting. And it comes really in there with Rome. You know, it's, it's, I think, 400 AD that they wrote, that Juvenal wrote the line, mains sana in corpore sano, which means a healthy mind and a healthy body. Okay. And that was the first time that they realized that if somebody was obese and 
didn't eat well, that they didn't think well either. And that they were, obviously these aristocrats were going to be the leaders of the future. And that if they were going to have right thinking uh, leaders, that they'd better have a gymnasium for them to, because their, their life no longer made the necessity. Your life is now making the necessity that you have to go out and do that yard work. It's great for you. <laughs> and I don't want to well, sign I, you to yard work, Carl, but. <laughs> well, I, I actually, uh, this is with intention I'm doing it because uh, I've been traveling so much and mm -hmm. I just, I had to stop. I just had to stop. I had a lot of health issues and a lot of major blood clotting issues when I got to Singapore last June. And you know that I, I was wanting to cut back anyways a lot, and um, so I have to do something different. And and on planes I wasn't exercising, and in hotels I did what I well I had my uh, suspension straps too, uh -huh. other little you know fit loop things and this and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter what it is; you can make anything work. Yeah, a set of stairs or whatever, and it, there's all kinds of things that could do, but. Uh, you know, I look at my wife as buffed and I'm like, I want to be like her because she's been doing this all these years that I've not been around to do it. So now I'm helping out. And you know what? It's a, it's, it's amazing. I've, I was telling somebody the other day, I think it was Steve, I feel stronger after the past couple of weeks. Now I don't know if I'm stronger or if it's just my body's getting used to it and it's easier for me, but I can show yeah, you get strong, but I think it's also you're, you're integrating a new set of tasks, a new set of things. You're integrating a whole new um, piece into it. I, I, this is my objection to gyms, and I know, I, I know your industry really goes for this, but uh, it seems to me that going to a gym three times a week is like going down to the store and buying some whey powder. You know, it's great. That's your supply of protein and whatever yeah. else is a supplement that you get. But you wouldn't think that that's your diet for the week. It's a supplement. <laughs> No. And so we, we, uh, we go to the gym or we go to yoga class. It's the same for other people in yoga class. And we think, okay, I'm all virtuous now. I've been to yoga class three times this week or I've been to the gym three times this week. But that's like I've taken this supplement three times a week. That's not your daily movement practice. So your stuff in the yard is your daily movement practice. Yeah, and then I feel much better that way. You know what's funny is I work in a gym. I've never been a fan of going to the gym I'll go in spurts while I'll go for three or four weeks and, you know, whatever. And then I just can't deal with it. It's, I, it, I can't do it. It's not my thing. I finally have found to just, well, man, if she sees this interview, she's going to make me do more yard work, but it's okay because, <laughs> because it's a good workout. And I'm, because I have an intention behind it now of, Hey, you know, I want to get stronger. I want to be able to, you know, throw these rocks and deal with these cinder blocks and put in the dock and do this. And I want it to be, I want to be feeling confident doing and strong and I can do it. And, and I do feel stronger and it feels, it actually feels really good. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm moving better. And well, for me, this is really good. So yeah. Interesting. So the scythe, that's really cool. Is that like a two-handle thing? Do you have a curved blade or a straight blade? Yeah, it's a two-handle thing with a curved blade. And, and yeah, except you're, you're making it, you're swinging it like a bat. I, if this is much more gentle and uh, kind of this swipey back and forth thing. But if you just, uh, of course, I'm going to relate it to the anatomy trains. You know, I get into my spiral lines and my functional lines yeah. and just how this thing is going very easily through my spine. And by the time I come back from 40 minutes of scything, I'm not sweating. Uh, it's not that kind of exercise, but I feel coordinated. I feel like I've been brought into, I'm, I'm, this is going to sound a little weird, but I feel like I'm one being when by the time I finish that, I kind of brought every, all the pieces together. Well, right. Cause you integrated so much in those movements, right? Yes. And but whereas if you go to the gym, you know, you're isolating out your quads and then you're isolating out your hip extensors and then you're isolating out the extensors or your abs or something. And that doesn't feel, that feels more piecemeal to me the yard work, as you call it, but that kind of thing brings your nervous system, your neuromuscular system into a coordination that the gym keeps in the machines. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. I, I, uh, my dad had a scythe, that's what I was gonna say. And I remember we had a, he had a garden. Um, this, this guy that we knew about a half mile out of town, 
mile from our house maybe had a big field and my dad would go in with that and just clear all the stuff on this like one acre that he would use for his garden and then he did all garden work because i didn't like that i would do it now though now i see my dad was in pretty good shape at that time too because he's squatting all the time he's working hard and digging and scything <laughs> i haven't i haven't read this yet but dan lieberman you know the guy who did the story of the body and did all the work on barefoot running yeah. um he went to kenya and whether he's back now or not or you know how this thing is going i don't know because i heard it from somebody else but um so if accurate reporting i don't know but the his idea was digging and carrying so the whole his whole argument is what's paleo and what's not you know the, a nike running shoe is clearly not paleo you know you, you can't find a basketball shoe that would have been around you know 40 or fifty thousand years ago and um so we did barefoot and so he got into you know what's and then he, his his thing before that was the head and he looked at all these skulls of people from you know thousands of years ago back in egypt they had perfect teeth no dental caries great big wide edges their wisdom teeth came in you know is that why do we have not have room because we don't chew on the same food like chewing is a really simple thing but if you don't chew sufficiently as a child and you know what are you being fed strained gerber strained carrots and strained squash and strained this you have no need to use you know what kids in the paleo era ate carrots <laughs> not strained carrots carrots so they had to chew them up you know so they developed their jaw and the actual pressure of the jaw on the head helps develop the jaw arches oh, and that, yeah. so we're not chewing enough we're not chewing leather we're not chewing hard seeds we're we're chewing mcdonald's stuff that's already been chewed for us and uh, therefore we don't use our our uh, jaws and therefore, we don't have room for our wisdom teeth. This isn't a problem of evolution, we, you know, or something like that. That's what I was told to me when my wisdom teeth were taken out at 18. It was just that I had a white food, white bread, soft diet when I was a kid. That's what did it. Interesting. I, I never knew that, never would have thought about that, but it makes total sense. So. <sighs> So all of your development in your body is an interaction between the genes that you have and then the activity that you put on top of that genes. This is epigenetics. It's yeah. a new way of thinking about this. And, and chewing is one of those. And he was looking at, well, what makes the difference between the bodies of today and what, what, what was the activity that really kept those people in such good shape? And um, he was coming back with digging and carrying. Wow. Yeah, I believe it that we were digging holes and we were carrying everything around everywhere. And um, of course he did the whole barefoot running thing and the long distance runners and stuff like that before, but um, it wouldn't hurt us to, uh, to get out of this thing, story that I've gotten stuck in. It wouldn't hurt us to uh, be back in the real world of actually, you know, what if, what if everybody had to do, it's, this is a Jewish idea really of, of putting everybody on a kibbutz, but what if instead of doing military service, you had to do two years on a farm? Um, you know, would that bring everybody into some kind of consciousness? I know my daughter thought chicken was something that appeared on a styrofoam tray with plastic over it. She never associated it with the actual bird. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm afraid that there's a lot of kids like this in our society now. Yeah, chicken is just a word mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I was reading a, a book again. I read many books a lot. Um, John Rady, Harvard, Go Wild. And in Go Wild, he talks a lot about this movement, um, carrying barefoot or minimal shoes. How it, you know, obviously, if you're going to be running in, you know, one, two millimeter shoes or something like that, you're, you're going to have different biomechanics and different muscles fire differently and you feel stuff more. I only know because I've done it, right? And um, actually, you know Dr. Emily Splickle, right? I'm sure you know Dr. Emily. I do not know. I know of her. I don't know her. Okay, yeah. She, um, we, I used to teach for her actually quite a lot, travel and teach, and that's all a barefoot training concept, not uh, barefoot running necessarily at all, just sensory <laughs> input. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Sensory input to the, you know, through the nervous systems to the brain and uh, improving that so we can send a signal back out, stabilize faster, quicker, better. 
mm-hmm. um, but also the bioma- biomechanically that's very interesting too when how everything's connected to everything else you know the abductor hallucis is connected to all the stuff up here well, I'm only talking to Tom Myers here, the author of Anatomy Change. So you might know. I was about, laughing a little. <laughs> you might know about this. <laughs> so please, I apologize if I said anything I shouldn't have, but uh, more so what I really do is just relating to how I wish other people knew this and took it seriously, actually. Well, I, I I have to say, Carl, I know it's difficult when you're behind this, but it's, um, well, as somebody who travels, I think you know that this really is moving across the world. People are recognizing the problem, the problem we said started in Greece with noble people not getting enough exercise. Well, guess what? We're all living like kings now. We all have running hot running water in our houses and you flick a switch and on comes the light. No king of any previous generation had that kind of power. We're all kind of like kings now. And uh, so we're all, in that sense, weakened because we don't have the necessity of life saying, you got to do this. You, you know, you got to get your food. You got to run away from this tiger. You're going to get trampled by this herd of horexes or whatever. And, and so necessity made us move a whole lot more. We have genes for being lazy, but we had the necessity. <laughs> Now we've got genes for being lazy, and we can be lazy because uh, you know food is readily available and not a lot of movement is required. It's, so people are recognizing that problem and saying, okay, what are we gonna do? People like you, Carl. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I tell them about you. So buy that book. Take his mm-hmm. classes, right? But I'm not. A, I am a theorist. I, you know, I, I have my own troubles with my own movement. Uh, I'm no guru in terms of training or anything like that. I'm, I'm trying to. Um, I'm 70, and so I'm trying to keep myself going uh, for as long as I can, like all the rest of us boomers. <laughs> in fact, I wrote a cartoon of, of the coronavirus coming along, saying, "Okay, boomer." <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like we're all getting our comeuppance here. Um, as boomers, and and besides that, <clears throat> this is maybe the way to end because I got to keep going. But um, we're all becoming millennials now, right? We're all sitting around binge watching Netflix. <laughs> yeah. You know, guilty I'm as charged. On my phone so much more than I was on my phone before. It's just kind of. I was calling up my daughter, and she's saying, "You're becoming one of us." <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Well, yeah, actually. So what I wanted to do before we wind up here is. Uh, and of course, we didn't script anything ahead of time. You don't know what I'm going to ask. No, no, please, please, whatever you'd like to do. Okay, so my one question is this. Is this current time, and this interview is going up right away, um, like tomorrow at the latest. Um, so in this COVID time, and right now it's April 11th, 2020, mm-hmm. do you have a takeaway message, advice, words of wisdom you'd like to share? I'll say takeaway message. Any takeaway message you'd like to deliver to people? Well. And it could be regarding anything, but I am kind of thinking of this COVID situation. Yep. Well, let me let me speak not from the exam, uh, from my position as an expert, but just as my position as an old person. This too shall pass. Everything does. Um, and if you're in a despair kind of feeling, then let that go. Because this will pass. It um Things will not go back to the way they were. I don't know exactly how they will change, but uh, again, my experience says that things don't go back to the way they were, but exactly how they will change is really unpredictable at this point. We all have a set of feelings right now. If you imagine six months from now and this thing is in your past, you're going to have a whole different set of feelings about it. Yeah. Even though you say, oh, I will remember what it was like in the middle of the COVID shutdown. You won't. Uh, it'll, it'll pass and then we'll get into the next phase and we'll see. But there are, my takeaway message from this is there are buds of opportunity that are going to grow out of these ashes and be on the lookout for them because some people are going to make um, a lot of money or a lot of fame or a lot of headway out of the buds that come up out of this. You know, it's just the same as California. After it burns off, then whole new growth comes in. And, uh, I think that's what we're gonna gonna see here. So if you're stuck to the way that you did it before, try to get yourself unstuck <laughs> because this is requiring a lot of adaptability from everybody. I love that. That's a great message. And I, I have to say when I first, probably a month ago when they shut down our gym, 
I just looked at a couple of the other trainers. Well, we're out of work. But this too shall pass because it has to. It can't not pass. So it will. Period. No, it will. I'm old enough to know, and they're like 20 something, and I'm almost 60. So just trust me, it'll pass. It'll be okay. <laughs> well, thank you. You're so welcome, Carl. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, and uh, I wish you, I hope everybody out there, but you too stay healthy, and you and your family, and uh, as we just said, this too shall pass, so we'll see you on the other side of it. You got it, my friend. Thank you for everything. I'll put a link to the website up here, anatomytrains.com, correct? Yep. That's the okay. one. Yep, so uh, anatomytrains.com, check it out. If you don't know about it, get over there and learn because it's awesome stuff. And Tom, we didn't talk you. anything about that. We didn't talk about fascia. We didn't talk about anatomy trains. Good for us. <laughs> we can do that next time. We can do that next, next time. Interview, next interview, mobilizing, mobilizing fascia. We'll do that somewhere down the road. All right, Carl. Cool, it's man. Good. Hey, good. thanks a lot, my friend. Good to talk with you. Take care. You too. Bye -bye. Take it easy now. Bye bye.